Anne, thank you so much for coming to be with us. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. So I want to go down this journey with you. I mean, I'm holding in my hands your beautiful new book. It is so beautiful. And I wanted to just hear a little bit about the story of how you even found your way to writing. Like, where does this start for you? To writing this book or writing it all? Like starting, you know, our listeners are, are people who really want to find more purpose and they're real creatives. And so I think that they'd love to hear a little bit about your process of like, since you were woken up to this gift. Well, um, I was always a good storyteller. I always could get my friends on the blacktop to gather around or they would come to me because they would want to um, hear my version of what they had all experienced collectively. And mm. I was a, just a voracious reader. And that was probably more important than anything. And um, um, then, uh, you know, I went to college and I dropped out to become a writer. I was 19 years old and I uh, didn't have a clue, but I did have a father who was a writer. And he taught me really the most important lessons of all, which is that you don't wait for inspiration. You, you create the habit. You sit down every day and you just do it, no matter how you're feeling and no matter whether you really know what you're going to be doing that day. You just meet, you just do it by prearrangement with yourself that you sit down at nine every day and you work for a while. So after that, I was off and running and I was very blessed to get a job at 20 with um, a Billie Jean King sports magazine that was called Women's Sports. And then I was off and running. You know, I had deadlines and I had, um, I had um, uh, harder and longer material that I learned to um, create and fashion and edit and then present. Wow, so cool. Thank you for sharing some of this with us. It's so generous. I'm sure you've shared this story so many times. I feel like one of the biggest things for our audience is this feeling of being afraid to th do things that are messy, to, oh, to yeah. be in that creative process. Mm -hmm. And when you said, you know, you just like made a time to sit down and write, mm -hmm. how do you find your way through to where the light starts to come? Um, I'm not positive the light ever actually comes. I just keep if i have something i'm working on or i've started and i'm i'm uh, letting myself do it it goes badly most days but i just keep i stick with it every draft i write is way too long and kind of overwritten um i uh, i just keep doing it over and over and taking stuff out and figuring out what's missing and then i always have a friend who's a really excellent writer who i trust and i um ask him to or neil my husband is really a great editor for me and i ask them to take a look at it and tell me what they think works or what doesn't work and then i decide whether i agree with them <laughs> i hate criticism but i'm incredibly grateful for um for being steered right because they only want to help me make the piece better and, uh, you know, I do probably three or four, anything I've written that you might have liked, I've done three or four drafts of, but I'm not sure that I could identify light ever coming on. <laughs> I love that you just laid out how there's the process of writing and then there's this longer process of editing where like it's, it's almost that you spend more time in the editing of something. Is that, is that fair to say? Um, no, I don't think that's quite right, but I spend a lot of time editing. I spend a lot of time shaping and deleting. Right. You know, Jessica right. Midford said famously, you need to kill your little darlings. And I go through the book slowly and I, I delete everything that just is too show-offy or just trying to be too erudite or too comic so that people won't think I'm a depressive and um so the edit does take a long time but the writing takes longer and that shitty first draft is the hardest 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 part of it at all it's scary to do things that aren't yes. don't look good and aren't presentable yes and to hear that coming from you is is just it gives people a lot of permission 
to hear that coming out of out of you. You know, you you've written books that have landed for millions and millions and millions of people. And it strikes me that you have so much empathy that you can really feel something that is so universal. Do you have a practice or some kind of a process where you drop in? How does that show up for you vis-a-vis what then comes out in your writing? Well, probably like you, uh, an idea will sort of float into my head like a goldfish because I am open for business. This is what I want to do when I grow up and I'm available <laughs> for any ideas or memories or, or uh, insights or um, I'm available. I'm available because I say I am and because I ask the great universal spirit to help me be available and permeable and curious about all of life. And um, and so ideas come into my head or a memory will come in. And unlike a lot of people who maybe are starting out or who don't feel like they're getting anywhere, I write it down. I always scribble it down on a um, index card. If, if I, I have very fair skin so I can write on my forearm or the back of my hand and then transcribe it later. But uh, the, probably the difference between me and a lot of your listeners is I get it down. I don't judge it as either being something that will turn into something else, lead to something else. If it came in and it got my attention, I write it down. I love that. This is what I want to do when I grow up. Well, you've certainly done it and are doing it. And and I love this idea, like I'm available. I'm available for it to come in. I feel like the most universal thing I've heard from our audience is this overwhelming feeling of being feeling like a fraud, uh -huh. feeling like I want to paint, I want to sculpt, I want to write, but I have this feeling of who am I to do this? Have you ever thought that thought? It seems it would be shocking to me if you did, but at the same time, since you're a human, it wouldn't be shocking to me at all. But I, I'm curious how, if you've had that thought, how you've overcome that. Oh, I think it all the time. And I mostly think it um, every day when I first sit down and I think it whenever I start anything new, I think, oh, what a fraud. What do I know? And then I think, boy, has the, I bet the well has run dry and I'm not going to be able to pull it off this time. And then I start to write and I think, oh man, talk about beating a dead horse. And you know, you just, I heard when I first got sober, you take the action and the insight will follow. And to me, that means that figure it out is not a good mantra and, um, uh, or, you know, uh, it's not a good slogan for life. It's very destructive. And, um, and so I, I just don't try to figure this stuff out. I just feel like I have this thing inside of me that wants to write and that wants to help me get it written. And so I just take the action. I just do the writing and it goes badly. And then I know <laughs> I've been doing this for 45 years professionally. And I know that if I just start and I let myself write badly, that it'll quiet those critical voices inside of me. That's so good. It's so good. You have no idea what this is like medicine for our listeners to hear you say this because they, these words are words they need to hear anyway. And then hearing them from you is really like a gift wrapped in the most beautiful bow. Well, I'd like to know how you got so many listeners, so many creative people that tune into you every week. Oh my gosh. I, you're the only, in 400 episodes, you're the first person to ask me a question. Because <laughs> I have curiosity. My husband's written a book and has a website called um, My Mind Has Gone Blank, shapesoftruth.com. And it's a spiritual book about quiet, largely about quieting the inner critic. And his, um, what's the word? His indication that he's on to onto something on his daily walk of both spirituality and creativity is that he gets his curiosity back you know and that's something that we had as children that we it turned out to not seem all that effective to the parents and teachers because what it what what they loved was us doing better than anybody else in the class right right and so yeah. to be the kid that was kind of the 
absent-minded professor, which I also was, and just to have that endless curiosity about life and the how do these green shoots that are breaking through the, gar <laughs> the concrete garden tile right outside my window, how do they break through concrete? But so um, I think that you probably started your podcast because you have that curiosity and um, both in your own creative life and also something that you could offer to other people that like you. But how did you, I mean, how did you get so many people, how did you suck them in? I love you. I'm, I'm literally, uh, I'm just so touched by this uh, moment. Um, but boy, this really is who you are like you and you're reading your books like the fact that you would even ask this I know to you you're like what this is just me I just heard John Kabat-Zinn say the other day in the beginner's mind there are endless possibilities right. in the expert's mind there are few right like when we right. think that we know what we know That's we true. lose doing, so much yeah. magic right yeah so how Was did I see on your show not yet but I do adore him I he's great too. he's so lovely and sweet because He's so immersed in the ordinary, you know, in the breath and yeah. each footstep. But um, Neil also at Shapes of Truth has a uh, thing I love that's very, very much what you were just saying, which was um, that the key to the kingdom, one of the keys to the kingdom of inside reserves of, of new material and insight and awakening is, I don't know. You know, I don't know. What's going to happen later today? Is the thing I'm doing tonight going to go okay? I don't know. What am I writing? I don't even know if I'm writing a, a novel or another book on creativity. Or I don't know. Yeah. But that opens up. The key, that is the key to the kingdom because then instead of being in my pinball mind where I'm trying to figure it all out and, and kind of horse it into submission and being able to tell people what I'm up to or what, how it's going, Instead, I step out into this kind of spacious, this glade, yeah. right? A glade where I can look around and go, wow, I never noticed that ring of redwoods. I never noticed that one knot hole. It's so big. I wonder what's inside. I'm yes. going to go look yes. I, because you know what? I don't know. Yes. And this is why... Uh, I think the podcast went well because I, of course, I, who doesn't know who you are, right? Of course I know who you are and I have the books, but I don't have an agenda. I kind of just want to be here with you. And I'm, I, I, I love what you just said about being in the great unknown, because so often people want some exhilarating experience. So they jump out of an airplane or they, who knows what, but if you want to feel the most unleashed, how about really stepping into the spontaneity of a moment without predetermining what you need to do to prep or how it's going to go. I yeah. know. Just trusting the moment to lead you there. Well, the best line I ever heard about writing, beside my father singing about bird by bird, was E.L. Doctorow saying that writing is like driving at night with the headlights on. You can only see a little ways in front of you, but you can make the whole journey that way. Right, and that so is so good. not me because um, I'm so anxious. I'd like to know what I'm gonna see in a mile or so, what the landmarks will be, and plus when I get to my destination, what should I look for? What has everybody else made of it? And plus, I secretly can't wait to get back home anyway. So to be willing to do the journey knowing that you can only see you know, 20 feet in front of you and to sort of immerse yourself in, in those 20 feet is to me the secret of life and be, of beginner's mind. Ah, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I just came from spending a week with Dr. Joe Dispenza and it's all about just like dropping into this unknown, just, just yeah. this heart coherence, right? When you're in the state of open-hearted vibration there's no way to control, right? That takes you right uh -huh. out of it. And when you're in that flow, there is the magnet, right? Now you're in uh -huh. this like force field where you're uh -huh. playing in this ease, right? And, right? and maybe things don't need to be pushed and hard. Maybe they can actually just be in a state of allowing. We can find something there. So uh -huh. of all the times, this book that you just wrote, this beautiful book, 
Thank you. What a perfect talk about like synchronicity, the timing of this message and this book. Did you know, did, I mean, it's almost like you knew that the world needed this hug, which is this book. Well, um, the last book, um, almost everything thoughts on hope was originally called doomed because the world was so bleak even two years ago. And this remember Australia was on fire. Oh my God. And yeah. The UN climate change papers had just come out and, um, um, everywhere I went to talk about this book, um, on hope, people didn't feel any hope. They felt exhausted and sad and scared. Mm -hmm. And this is a year before COVID. So I decided to just write a book that would, well, be about, would be about that. Like, where do we start? How do we get our hope back? How do we get our faith in life that something supports us um, no matter what things look like or how long they take? And um, so, and everything, you know, I always tell my writing students, write what, you, what, write what you'd love to come upon because um, that tells you something deep inside of your soul is um, really trying to get your attention and um, and I would have I would love I love to come upon books like this that are funny and sort of acerbic but also spiritual and that have a solution for that day's um, fear or um, or a feeling of, of being flattened by by life that just made me want to cry when you said right what you wish you could what you would want to come upon it's like it's like your soul immediately knows ah oh, I want to hear this, right? I, I wish I could hear this. Uh -huh. And um, I know that on your virtual book tour, you're you're chatting with Janine Roth. And I, I just found that fascinating because I love you and I've been floored. I know I'm late to the party, but I only this year read Women, Food and God and I have not been able to stop talking about it. And because there's something that she's able to facilitate that you also do in this book, which is make space for the darkness. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Sure. About welcoming it to the table. Yeah. You know, the, the problem for most of us, and certainly with all of our collective eating disorders and our, our um, bad body thoughts and our going without food and our shaming ourselves if we think we eat all of that and let alone our creative blocks and our, um, our, our blocks around intimacy and they all have to do with pretending so much of it, us isn't really there because we yeah. think that we will be exiled or um, people will find us disgusting. Whereas Janine and I, you can get it at, you can get the podcast at her website that we, at her Facebook page. I mean, um, it's the, it's the way home, you know, to welcome all the dark stuff, to say it's universal. You know, I don't have any shame or self-doubt that you don't have. And you don't have any that I don't have. You know, there's really only one of us, you know, except for Donald Trump, I think was maybe an, an, <laughs> an, an, a one liar, or whatever they call it, a one off. Um, but um, it's just the nature, uh, it's the human condition. It's that ping pong game of, you know, of slowly evolving self-love and self-respect and, and um, kindness towards self. And then that on the other side of the ping pong table, the self-doubt and the meanness and the shame and the perfectionism. So, I mean, Women, Food and God is one of the most brilliant books literally I've ever read. It's like every single thing I need to know about all of life. And <clears throat> so much of it has to do with welcoming all that shadow stuff in and finding people who are so safe that you can say to them, do you have a minute? I want to tell you about something that's come up. It's, I hate it and it's kind of scary, but I think it might need a little attention and sunlight. And the person, since you only have probably three of those people, isn't going to say, oh no, I, I really, if it's negative, I don't want it. You know, they're not going to say that. They're going to say, of course I do. What is it? And you tell them, they go, oh, me too. I have that all the time. I had it so badly. I was so scared on Sunday. I woke up with that bad voice. And I um, I actually called my, you know, Overeaters Anonymous sponsor, or I, I texted my minister, or I told my husband, and we ended up laughing about it. And then once I was laughing, I was halfway home. You know, laughter really is carbonated holiness. 
And when we laugh about that dark, scary stuff. Also, Trevor Noah said last week, um, when you laugh with someone, you know you've really shared something. And that's so beautiful to me because when you're sharing this stuff, instead of trying to lock it in the very highest drawer in the psychic garage, it just is going to keep running you. But to share it, to tell it, to get some sunlight on it, and to laugh about it is is a, a small miracle, and it's always a solution for me. Yeah, and I feel like that's why you are such a lighthouse for people, because you can hold space first for what hurts and welcome it, like you said, to the table, and then offer a little bit of that joy and it doesn't feel fake or forced. Yeah. I think that there's so much of this like positive thinking, you know, like white knuckle it, say this to yourself every day. But if there's a part of you that's doing that while at the same time shaming the parts of you that you do not want to witness, that's not going to go very far. And one of the best things in her book is the idea that the medicine for the pain is, is the pain, right? Feeling it. And, and then as you feel it, you're practicing the opposite of self-abandonment. And then you, you realize there's something bigger than the pain holding the pain. Yeah. And so that journey I felt was, you know, such a, such a beautiful um, back, backdrop to what you're doing in this book, which is tell us what you said before about what would you want people to come upon? What were you hoping people would walk away with from reading this? I was hoping that they would come upon, uh, they would walk away with hope because the book is so much about um, the hope of uh, ordinary life. Like we don't need to have mystical experiences. We don't need to, you know, be tapped on the head by God who doesn't have a magic wand anyway, which I think would be a much better system. But that <laughs> there is there is hope in in our love for each other there is hope in the precious community there is hope in service that if you're bringing people food um that gives them hope because they can feed their child and maybe there'll be more food tomorrow and if you're bringing the hope then you're surrounded by hope then you if you brought the hope you got hope in the environment again i wanted to help people really laugh about this stuff this business of being human i um I wanted to help people know, like, where do you begin? Where do you begin making a comeback from addiction or a childhood that was just so scary or abusive? Where do you get started creatively? Where do you start? Well, the answer to all of those is that you start where you are. You know, you start where your butt is and you let yourself <clears throat> not do it perfectly. You break through the perfectionism by doing it badly more often, you know, and... Uh, and you find people that will help you. If you're a writer or an artist, you find somebody who will give you the feedback, who will say always that they love it or they're going to love it. And they're wondering if maybe you want to take out some of this stuff and use it elsewhere. And that you think that on page, the very bottom of page two, the piece really takes off and that the first page and a half is really just clearing your throat, clearing their throat. And maybe try a new lead, which is um, a set, the sentence that is the last paragraph at the bottom of page two. Always, always, always someone helping you will point out that you've gone on too long, you know, and that a, a, and a one and a half page passage might be a really beautiful one paragraph and that the ending is seven pages before you end it. You know, it really ends on a dime way earlier than you end it and, and maybe try to write to that new ending stuff like that. So um, I hoped people would have, you know, I sometimes when, when I travel when when we're not in lockdown, I'm usually either talking about faith or writing. And I can actually bring the notes for either thing because they're exactly the same. You start where you are, you start where your feet are, you breathe, you go left foot, right foot, left foot, breathe, you ask for help. It's okay to ask. There's no shame in asking for a lot of help. You, um, you read the great masters, you sit at their feet, you study how they conveyed their understanding of life and what works and what has really maybe helped keep us safe and we don't need anymore. Neil's book the, um, and website are uh, Shapes of Truth are very much about quieting the inner critic. Because, and I call it, you read 
Dust Night Dawn, there's a chapter that begins, Dread was my governess growing up. Neil uses the phrase superego, and he just is so brilliant about how it kept us alive, you know, till the age of six or seven. We, it kept us from running out into the street or swimming out too far, and we don't really need it now. I'm going to be 67 in a month, and I, I'm really good about cr crossing the street, <laughs> and I'm a really strong swimmer. And I never swim alone. So, um, but that, what Neil calls a superego, um, or my governess dread, same thing, um, are always going to appear. And so, you know, you uh, and what I tried to do before I met Neil was to just eradicate it, <laughs> eradicate that critic, but that, but, and you know what? It, my friend Terry, who's a aged Diocesan priest in LA, he says, we don't get over much here. And so I'm always going to hear the voice of dread trying to keep me small and afraid and to not do things that might not be perfect. But I can invite her, I can invite her to the table and I can say, God, you did such an amazing job. You kept me alive. I was a, you know, impetuous little child. I couldn't wait to get to the next place I was headed. And I thank you for that. But I'm wondering if you, you know, I've got this incredible thriller I'm writing, right, reading right now. I wonder if you might <laughs> want to sit down. I've got work to do, but you might want to sit down and just see if you, give this book a go and we'll talk later. I love that. And I, I love how you said that you're either speaking about faith or writing and you can use the, the same notes because they're, they're so similar. And when we had Julia Cameron on the show, she speaks so much about writing and also so much spirituality comes out of her mouth. And, and I said to her, I've never heard somebody use the word God so often without any kind of, there was nothing heavy about it. It's just right. like, she's so dropped into that. Right. How, how did you find your way home spiritually? How do you connect? So many people have such a tough time um, connecting to something in the great beyond? Well, I kind of, I think, came this way, although my parents were atheists and you weren't allowed to talk about it. My grandfather was a Presbyterian missionary in Tokyo, so my father was raised there. Wow. And, um, you know, Presbyterians, which actually I became, are called God's frozen chosen. And um, my <laughs> father just hated Christianity. And I always found Christian friends, the Catholic girl first, who told me I was going to rot in hell for all eternity because I wasn't a baptized Catholic. And um, so that was helpful. And then um, a Christian <laughs> science friend that I, whose house I really grew up at and who I still see three or four times a week for a hike 60 years later. Um, and her mother was reading Mary Baker Eddy to us every morning. And Mary Baker Eddy really is the mother of new thought, you know, of Eckhart Tolle and Marianne Williamson and um, she just thought I was beautiful and perfect and that there was only love and something inside of me just gobbled it up. And I tried to not be a Christian because my father hated Christians so much. And, and I really, really read a lot of the great masters in every, um, tradition, a wisdom tradition. And I still read the great masters in every wisdom tradition. But when I was still drinking, I sort of, um, accidentally ended up at this funny failing little church <laughs> in the uh really what you'd have to call especially back then 35 years ago it was it's a ghetto you know it's a very very poor place in a very rich county and um and I loved the little church I knew a lot of the songs they sang from the civil rights movement which my parents were very involved in and and the weavers and Joan Baez and the great songs of freedom and liberation and I'd hear them wafting out when I was at the flea market, severely hungover, and um, I wandered in, and, and they didn't try to get me to do it. It's like with Julia Cameron. She doesn't try to get you. She doesn't have a position she wants you to come over to, and they didn't either. They could just see that I was scared. I was emaciated. I was probably smelly, and I had, you know, I had a little crummy little bike I got around on, and um, so little by little, I just stopped resisting at all, you know, and my friend Terry, who I already just quoted in uh, L.A. said, 
um, the point is not to try harder. The point is to resist less. And, mm -hmm. um, and I just stopped resisting the songs and the spirit and the, um, you know, the, it, it was a little sanctuary church dur during Vietnam and it was a real Black Lives Matter church 40 years before the, the formal movement. And um, I just found a home there. And I just stopped trying to resist that. Stop trying to resist that. That takes so much strength. I, I heard um, a woman recently whose daughter just had a horrible brain injury in a, in a freak accident. I heard her say, "Hope is excruciating." Mm -hmm. And uh, is she your said, child "Okay." She's alive, but she's she went from being a. a a completely whatever you want to quote unquote normal happy nine-year-old to being barely able to you know raise a hand and she can't speak she can't eat but How she shows it been? it's been like a year and a half and she's an artist she has a big following Lindsay letters is her instagram i know some of my audience knows who she is and she's so brave she shows up sometimes in between her painting posts and she's she cries and she says Hope is excruciating. And, and I wanted to bring it back to your journey and also to what you said about the book, wanting to offer hope. And when I hear about people, when you share stories the way you just did, it's so courageous to take those baby steps, right? To, mm -hmm. to be willing to show up and not escape or numb whatever you were not wanting to feel whenever you were, you know, not sober and to keep showing up and not resisting something that feels good that's really hard to do especially when we've all been through so much mm -hmm. how do people begin to step into the sun when at first it hurts your eyes right you're scared to let it in you're scared not to resist it it's just it's scary and it's hard and anyone that hands you a nice christian bumper sticker um, is not somebody I want to trust because it does uh, truth and grace don't arrive in um, in cute bumper stickers and um, how you, you you go out into the light and you blink and it's awful and it um, is scary and then you run back inside and then you make yourself a lovely cup of tea and you give yourself total kudos for that courage like you would a girlfriend You'd say, oh my, you went outside? Wow, good for you. And um, and then little by little, it doesn't hurt your eyes so much. And, um, and then little by little, you start noticing that here and there are things that actually do help and do, um, that do work in terms of help building, you know, it's kind of like soul nautilus, you know, you get, you, you do, these brave, you do things afraid, you know, do it scared is a good battle cry. And then you build soul muscles. And then you can try harder and harder things like to actually talk to other people. And then you find other people who are going through what you've gone through or are right in the smack dab in the middle of, and you share your experience, strength and hope. And they say stuff that is, that blows your mind. And you think, how could you possibly feel faith in life again after what you've lost? And then they say, well, I like to, I try to notice what st is still here. And it's pretty magical. If I, there was this guy in, uh, who helped Bill Wilson get AA off the ground. Uh, he was not himself an alcoholic. He was a priest. In 1935, he said to Bill, um, sometimes I think that heaven is just a new pair of glasses. You know, and so you can have the glasses on that are, that have blinders on and you see so little that way and you see what you're able to tolerate, what you're able to look up and see. But if you, with intention, change glasses, being aware that to see so much that's vulnerable and, and uh, precious and, and maybe even your own deepest inside injured little kid but you have these good pair of glasses on, you see the courage that it takes and you see the beauty that that, that courage 
is manifesting for other people. It's also, it's like Rumi said, through love, all pain will turn to medicine. And so you find somebody you love and who you can trust and you tell them this stuff and they tell you their stuff and it sucks. My best friend's son just died two months ago and it sucks. She, he was 23, he was a perfect being and it sucks and it was a grace-filled, light-filled experience for both the boy who died, Mason, and for the family. And she wrote a book called um, The Opposite of Certainty and I quote, I mention it a lot in Dust Night Dawn um, she talks about lunch money face and that you, uh, you know, you just want to exude and, and hold this extravagant faith that everything will turn into blessing and that everything happens for a reason and whatnot. And she, she reminded me of when we were kids and it, Tuesday, at least in California, it was hot dog day and you got a quarter, <laughs> never more, never less, because a quarter bought you a hot dog, a bag of chips, which cost five cents back in the day and a, a carton of orange um, drink. It was incredibly good and freezing cold. <laughs> and, um, and so she talks about lunch money faith that if she just looked around every day, she'd get just the right amount. She'd get she'd never more, never, but never less, but enough. Mm. That's, it's perfect. It's really perfect. I love it so much. It makes, it makes it feel attainable, yeah. that little bit. And, and not just attainable, but available and in you yeah. right now, once you stop resisting. Or also, it's like with Neil saying the I don't know. I don't know what it would look like, but you think you know. It should look like this, that I stop crying. Crying is the very, very best thing any of us can do. It's so hard because we have all been shamed into stiff upper lipping it. And getting over it and and having you know the battle my parents battle cry was and my teachers battle cry when I was coming up was you have got to get thicker skin well you know I would have loved to have thicker skin but what they were saying was we would all be much happier to be around you if you were a completely different person right which is not helpful and the reason I'm a creative being is because I don't have thick skin I have really thin skin I'm permeable stuff gets in me stuff comes out of me and if you're going to be an artist you better be you know like a tide pool where a water of life and of families and of the celestial washes over you and through you and sloshes around inside of you and brings you the krill and the tiny shells and the keyhole limpets and then you work with it, you feel it, you sit down with it and then you, it washes back out over anyone who might read you or come upon what you've been up to all this time. And so, um, I forgot. I, I hope that answered your question. It's so beautiful. I was going to ask you this question from the from the standpoint of, of talking about hope and letting the light in. Recently, I, we had a friend of mine here, Alison Bird, who's a beautiful African-American, powerful, fierce woman. And she was talking about how stepping into our power can be so relatable. And yet for so many people, she said, we have this feeling of remorse. Like, who am I to be yeah. happy? Who am I to be joyful? Who am I to, I need to run back to those who aren't. And she says, but you have to run back with the medicine, which is your power, step into your power, right? Enjoy yeah. your life. Like, and, um, and women, especially she was talking about, you know, like coming through the patriarchy, there's this like apologizing for joy. Don't be too happy. Don't shine too brightly. You'll, you'll, oh, yeah. you'll hurt someone else. And so just the offering of hope is triggering for some people sometimes as like, well, if I really showed up and, and let the light in, people might judge me or walk out of the door. or I might feel guilty and ashamed of the light. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, I think one of the blessings of being a little bit older, i.e. in what I like to think of as extremely late middle age, is that some of that chips off, you know, or I think of it as that through love, through therapy, through recovery, through a deepening daily spiritual walk, you realize how much stu stupid stuff you've been carrying around in your airplane for all these years and it just has kept you flying so low, you know, barely skimming the treetops. 
And by 50, everyone's lost somebody that should still be alive, that you really can't live without, too. Um, and so you realize that, that you gotta, you got to get serious about how you're going to live in the face of the mort our mortality. And how much longer are you going to be mean to yourself because yeah. you have really cellulite thighs? You know, how much longer are you going to try to get, uh, like I've been trying for 45 years to get the New York Times book review to take me seriously, and they just don't. It's just not going to happen for me. And, and at about 50, I realized I was kind of done. Now, I'm kind of triggered every time. I'm triggered this time. But it's really brief. I'm triggered briefly instead of like for the entire entire two weeks or a month of publication. And so, um, you know, when I was a kid in the 50s and then early 60s, you just, women were not taught that they could be juicy and bright, that it was the men that were mm -hmm. juicy and bright and everything the women did went into help pumping up the men so they could make the living and being and getting the men out of their despair so that there would be trickle down and they'd be nicer to the wife who could then nourish the children. <sighs> and that was the system, you know, and that was the owner's manual. And it's a long way back from that belief system. And, you know, it's almost like if you are too juicy or bright, it's like the evil eye is going to look at you or that long bony finger is going to come down out of the sky. And say, <laughs> you, you signed the contract that you wouldn't glow like this. I happen to be really good at math. Girls weren't supposed to be. It was fine that I was a great storyteller or I could write well. That was could be a girl thing. But yep. you, I wasn't supposed to be better than the boys in math because it made them feel bad and it wasn't uh, assumed that I could go anywhere with it, you know? And so, um, you know, but the women's movement came out when I was about 16, the first issue of Ms. Magazine, and that changed everything. That was, you know what? I am going to have all these feelings and emo emotions that you've said I can't have. I am angry and I am grief struck and I am going to exhibit those and I am really good at math and I'm going to stop, I, you know, I'm going to stop feeling bad about that. I always did well. I never stopped doing well at it. I stopped feeling sort of shy about it that I'm better than the boys in my class. And um, so... It kind of, for me, and I, I bet it's true for you, although, how old are you? You look very young. Oh, that's so old you. 41. No way. We well, have beautiful skin. That's a blessing. Thank yeah. You. But even, you know, my 40s, um, I loved. Because the 30s were sort of transitional. You had one foot in, what are you going to make of yourself, right? A lot of people had their babies then, and in 20s and 30s, and... And you, um, but you're still, for me, I was still kind of obsessed with um, trying to get my body. I had a, let's see, I tr when I turned 40, I had a five-year-old. I was a single mother. I didn't have a cent. And I had a great career and uh, I had a lot of love. I grew, I've, I've been born and raised in the same county I li live in. And um, I had a lot of love, but I still had these Swiss cheese holes in me in my soul, but you sort of know by about 40 because of all that you've read and, and the brilliance of your very best friends that what's the, the stuff that's out there that you can achieve or date or marry or buy or lease is not going to fill those holes. And you start to get serious about the spiritual uh, and the psychological healing. And I loved my 40s, you know, and because um, I really stepped into a shape that had been waiting for me all along where I no longer cared quite as much about my butt, you know. And I realized that when you go to heaven, you know, it's 197th on the list of what mattered here was what your butt looked like. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that, you know, and Sam, my son Sam, who has a podcast called Hello Humans, he, um, uh-oh, my mind went blank. What was he, what does he say? He, um, I forgot, it'll come back to me, I'm sorry, but it's something very much about no longer caring about this stupid stuff that you've been so obsessed with yeah. that you're not, you don't seem to get anywhere with. Um, every single time I publish, I'm going to feel angry and slightly bitter and slightly shamed that the New York, the, the white male East Coast literati has not chosen me as its it, it girl. 
And But at 40, God, I felt a lot less tweaked by that. I feel like, oh God, whatever. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you two things about that. One of the things I was going to say is, is right in line with this whole conversation. I feel like we are all as women, I think we're taught to be good. You know, we're taught to be nice. And uh, unfortunately, good most of the time means being compliant and conforming. And then as you get older, you start to realize, wait, what if I don't want to be good or nice? Yeah. And, and so as you were talking about things that you start to realize don't matter, you are someone who is very, very courageous and puts so much out in the world. How have you learned to be okay with the people who won't like it and, and stick to yourself and not be good, not be nice, but just be authentic? Well, you know, I am so good, and I am so nice, and I am kind, you know? I just am. And uh, my friend David Roach, R-O-A-C-H, um, do you know him? He's the pastor of the Church of 80% Sincerity. Oh, everybody. Oh, my God, that's the best Yeah, yeah just go title. on. David Roach and the Church of 80% Sincerity. And he says 80% of anything is just fantastic. 80% honesty, 80%... Um, sweetness and goodness, 80% authentic, 80% of anything. And um, it just, when I, when I became friends with him 20 years ago and started to become a member of that church, it just so freed me. And, um, and I still don't do cruel things. I have really bad thoughts, but I don't usually share them on paper. I, um, when I share anything about myself that seems extremely cranky or negative, it's because I know it's universal. I don't write about my family in any way that will hurt any of them. People at, in writing classes always ask, um, what about stuff that, from my childhood that w really makes somebody look terrible? I say, well, first of all, you own everything that happened to you. And if they wanted you, you to write more warmly about them, they should have behaved better. And also, this is why fiction exists. If people are still alive, you turn it into a novel or a screenplay right. instead of a memoir, and um, and then you can write. If you change the, if you make it be the um, the olive-skinned Catholic family down the street instead of your own pale, blue-veined family, they don't even recognize themselves. People never recognize <laughs> themselves. I change their hair color and their height. <laughs> And it's literally true. I mean, in my second, third novel, Joe Jones, <laughs> there's a character named the world's most, her name was Faye, the world, and her nickname was the world's most negative person. Because no matter what you <laughs> mentioned, it'd be like this malignant word association game. And you'd say, oh, it's so beautiful and blew out. And she talked about melanoma or seagull poop, you know, and um, the bacteria in the seagull poop. And, um, and I just used everything she said. And um, I just wrote it down and used it for baby, but I changed her height, and I changed her hair color, and I changed her age, and, and put it in a novel. And when um, the novel came out, after about a month or so, she called me and said, hey, do you want to go for a walk? You know, I said, oh, sure, hard in my throat, so busted. And then um, we got together and said, oh, I just love that book. I said, oh, thank you. And she said, you know, that character Faye was so hilarious, and I went... And then she said, I know someone just like that. And so... Um, it's so good. It's so yeah. good. And also the fact is that with all creativity, mostly I know about writing, um, you, the first draft, it says in Bird by Bird, the first draft is a child's draft. You just get it all down. The second draft is the parent's draft, and you clean it all up. And at that point, you can take out some of the stuff that maybe seems harsh. And the third draft is a dentist draft, and you go through it passage, par tooth by tooth, and paragraph by paragraph, and you wiggle and jiggle and floss, and a lot of teeth are just fine. Some of them need a little attention, um, maybe professional help. So um, I, I can say I'm kind of pathetically kind, and most women that I've known are, and it's a huge victory. I have to disappear for one second to turn my, feet, my heater on. It's a huge victory to stop being quite so kind all the time and to be and to sometimes say things that 
maybe you feel bad about, but then you go back and you say, you know what, I didn't mean it like that, and I'm sorry I said it, but the truth of what I need for you to hear is. And then maybe some truth and healing comes out of that. Turn on your heater. Um, that's so good. <laughs> that's so good. Okay, one of the last questions I was going to ask you. So you said that right around that time, you said around 40, you said I had a five-year-old and I, you said I, I didn't have much money. So for people listening who have admired you, who look at themselves and say, well, I'm 40 and I've never made a career yet out of this. I thought it was too late for me. What do you say to women who are figuring out more of themselves later on? Is it too late or can we, can we find a way to do it? Um, you know what? There is only now, there is only the holy moment and I would tell my Sunday school kids, this is the day that God has made, and only you can ruin it. And uh, so if you, uh, mostly when I would have big groups of students, they, we'd spend a lot of each class listening to them explain why they weren't getting any writing done, and how as soon as they moved up to the Russian River where it's really quiet, they were going to get to work, or right. how their last child, when their last child was out of the house, they were going to fill in the blank. And I always said to them, you know, you know, if you don't do it now, you're not going to do it then. It's like thinking if you lose 20 pounds, you're going to start being really kind and respectful to yourself and, and seeing your body with more respect. And I said, if you're not okay at 180, you're not going to be okay at 150. It's an inside job. And so my, my, with my students, I said, well, can you, you're going to have to meet me halfway one day at a time, if you're going to get your creative work done, you know, and people say, well, you know, I go to the gym four days a week, this is before COVID, and I'd say, can you go three days? You know, I feel so great if I go four days, and I go, how much writing are you getting done? Well, I haven't actually started yet. Okay, if you, can you give up one, can you give up one day of going to the gym and have four days where you might write for an hour? Well, but, and they're always explaining why they can't get to it and I'd say you got to stop not writing you know right. your days are spent not writing and if you want to start writing you got to meet me halfway you got to find me some time find me the two hours that gym takes you have to get there you work out for an hour you shower you drive home it's two and a half hours what do you do at night what do you do at 10 o'clock well I watch the 10 o'clock news can you give me that half hour well it really helps me unwind I'd say you don't really seem that unwound, plus you pay this enormous amount of money to be here and you're not getting any work done. What if you did a half an hour at 10 o'clock every night? And um, so it's never too late. Lots of the writers that people love most started late. Um, my son is outside trying to wave and get my attention. Shoo, shoo, mommy's working. <laughs> uh, um, and uh and so it's like you stop not writing, you stop not dancing, you stop not writing songs, you stop, you stop not choreographing dance numbers, you know, and maybe you're choreographing them for the, for the, the old folks at a home, maybe you're choreographing them for, uh, you know, middle school kids who all hate their bodies anyway, and maybe you're doing a, a restoration kind of dance with sixth graders who hate themselves. And, um, and then you say, oh, I don't want to do it. I want to do it at a bigger on stage. Well, that's very nice, but, but learn how to do it here first. Learn to do it for this group of people and then take it, you know, take it bigger. Take it bigger. Get good at it. Get better at it. Get good at it. Do it every day. Do it badly. Find a way to communicate this one thing that you've started doing, that you've gotten better at. It's like learning piano. If you play every day, you will get better. And then you can try harder and harder arrangements or, or, or writing experience, uh, exercises or, you know, you can bite off more and do it a little bit better. But, you know, it doesn't happen down the road. It just doesn't. We don't know if we'll be here down the road. So you do it today. You figure out the half hour, 45 minute pod you can give to me as a debt of honor to your own soul that you have longed to start doing this. And as a debt of honor today, you're gonna do it from three to 345. And I can <laughs> promise you, it probably won't go well, but you're gonna feel different for the rest of the afternoon and all night. It's so beautiful. What a, 
I just feel so nourished and, and filled up spending this time with you. Tell us where we can find the book, where we can find more of what you're doing in the world and follow along. I have to shout at the dog briefly. Go away! The dog wants to come into my <laughs> office now. Go away, bad dog. You can find it anywhere. Just, you know, go to your favorite independent bookstore. If you if you can't get out, go to Amazon. Just, it's, it's I, I am so out there and available. If you if you want a book um, for, on creation, creativity, get bird by bird. If you want to see what you and I have been talking about this last hour, get Dust Knife Man, get it anywhere. Yeah. Well, I'm sure everybody knows you already, but this was just such a gift that you are just so humble and so generous to oh, have shared you. all of that. You're, yeah. it's, you, you have such a beautiful spirit and I just thank feel you. like what a gift to have been you. around you. Thank you so much for this. We're going to put all the links in the show notes and, and I have no doubt that, I mean, everything you do turns to gold. So Thank you. Thank you for having me. I love being here with you for an hour. Now I'm going to go eat. I'm starving. Okay. Okay. Bye, Bye honey. Bye. Bye. Bye.